and Bola to Bola on iHeartRadio. And also AMFM247.com. John Mosier back with us as well. And uh, we have a fantastic guest with us on the line. Uh, he is pretty damn amazing. He has a great book. So, Dennis, tell us a little about your book here, my friend. Well, first off, I want to thank you again for the chance to be with you and to, uh, to really uh, uh, have some uh, chance to go deep on it. The book is called The Trust in What We Cannot See. It's my eighth book. Uh, I came to uh, being an author late in life. And uh, when, then when I started, I felt like a rocker. I just couldn't stop. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell us about this, this book. Tell us about some of the goals for the book that you have, my friend. Well, you know, when anybody ever thinks about, hey, I think I'll write a book, and I think there's a book in every one of us, uh, comes the story, is it about your life, is it about things you've seen? Well, in this case, I wanted to do an, a historical uh, science fiction book uh, based on uh, historical truths. And so what started out was a very, very odd, uh, very unusual event about three or four years ago. My bride Susan and I were traveling with some friends on a bike and barge across Europe. We'd stay in the barge at night, and then we'd bike along the Danube River during the day. And we went in to, uh, in, into Vienna, Austria, and we were having uh, a beer and some Wiener schnitzel, and something in the back of my mind, gentlemen, uh, hit me, and it was, wait a minute, I think I've read about, is there a coffee shop nearby? And, you know, Hans, the, um, the nice uh, German-Austrian... Uh, and the waiter says, yeah, you're talking about uh, Cafe Central. And I said, yes. And he goes, you go down here to the left, turn to the right, and park your bikes right there and go in. So what it was was that this cafe had been built in 1876, a long, long time ago. And by the 1900s, early 1900s, it became the Cafe to Vienna, which meant both the high-brow people and a lot of the low-brow would go there. It was a so so ba basically basically m my kind of place. Uh. Well, I tell you, I think all, all of us would feel comfortable there. You, the highbrow, yes, on your end. The lowbrow on my, my on my end. I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of the characters that hung out there, that really yeah. historically hung out there, were were amazing. Young Adolf Hitler, who lived just down young the street. Young Adolf Hitler. Young Adolf Hitler. He was in his twenties, but who else lived around the corner from him and was in his twenties? was Joseph Stalin, who was living in Vienna. But I feel like this is a Ginzu knife commercial. But don't stop there. The, the, <laughs> uh, the, the, third guy, the third guy was Vladimir Lenin, who lived around this cor the corner from Stalin but did not know Stalin. Wow. And then down the street, no, we're not done. Down the street <laughs> was Leon Trotsky, who was the father of Pravda uh, News, and Marshal Tito was a teenager who lived nearby. All oh, these Lord. guys, they all lived in the same neighborhood. And they went to the same coffee shop, the coffee shop that I was sitting in three or four years ago. Holy I had to write smokes. this book. Holy smokes. John, what, what do you make of all this? It's pretty unique. I mean, the thought of all the people from the same area at the same coffee shop, it's pretty wild there. I mean... I was reading your here on your website like that. Um, you went to West Point, and then what made you decide to try to run for Congress? Well, that's a great question. I, I think it's it's wrapped right tightly around the book actually because okay, I love okay. history. I love history. When I uh, West Point actually is uh, an element in this book uh, to question what we cannot see, and I tap into. The background of that, uh, I was president of my class at West Point, enjoyed it immensely. I had a phenomenal respect for people who had uh, served and who were serving in public service as well. And so uh, about 20 years ago, I had the honor of running for the United States Congress. Uh, didn't win, had a great opportunity in Idaho, uh, where I live, in Boise, Idaho. It is a phenomenal place to be involved. A lot of a lot of great-hearted people, people who've grown up here, people like myself who've moved in, and that's what I wanted to tap into with to trust in what we cannot see. I wanted to ask the question: What if? What if you could go back through time in your own life, like my character does in this historical science fiction book, who is an author who goes back through time, who then makes a decision 
to either change or eliminate those five men. And, and that's the story. It is a remarkable story that when I was all done with it, I looked at my wife, who is my, you know, 43 years of being married, you guys. Uh, she's probably my, oh, my harshest critic and my best supporter. And she looked at me and she read that manuscript and she went, this is badass. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed. I went, what? You know, because she, uh, she saw it. She saw the vision. Because the real question becomes in all of our lives, what if? What if we would have done certain things in our life? That might have moved a little bit uh, better or maybe even a little worse what would have happened and so in the process of this it's kind of fun guys because i chose to, i chose to uh integrate people's lives into the book like for example willie nelson i i contacted <laughs> willie's family yeah i contacted <laughs> willie's family and i said hey i want to use his name in the book and i want to have some fun while we're doing it uh they ended up saying, yes, they got the original manuscript. They said, yes. Uh, uh, Peter Frampton, everybody who has got a touch of male pattern baldos or a little gray in their beard, they all know Peter Frampton because right. Frampton comes, Frampton comes alive. Because Frampton comes alive, that's right. <laughs> and when I, was, when, I was a kid, when I was a kid out at West Point, we put on a concert there and we invited Frampton to come. And so uh, he came and he borrowed one of our – uh, West Point jackets and went on stage and rocked it, baby, rocked it. So about oh I don't know two years ago he was coming through the Pacific Northwest and I had the uh, I had the opportunity to enjoy uh, after the concert a great discussion my wife and I with him, reminding him of that time at West Point. He goes oh man that was the that was the greatest concert I ever gave. I couldn't believe I was at West Point in a cadet uniform rocking it. I said yeah well I I was class president I helped put that thing on. And we laughed, and I said, Peter, I've put you in my book. Okay, you good with that? And he, he goes, give me the manuscript. So I did. got back to me. He goes, I love it, man. I love it. Because it's it's historic, <laughs> historical science fiction. Right. So I've got him. I've got Mark Twain. I've got incredible people who are a part of this. If you could only tweak their lives by bringing them together. Here's the other thing now, and then I'll shut up and open myself up for questions. But I love physics. At West Point, you either love it or it doesn't love you, one or the other. Yes. And and uh, and so one of my favorite writers is a guy named Brian Green. He's a physicist, uh, and he wrote a book called The Elegant Universe. And it so impacted me about time travel and the string theory and just incredible that I wrote him and I said, I want to include your book and your name in my historical science fiction. He, he got back to me and he goes, man, let's do it. Let's have some fun. So the book <laughs> is fun and it's fact and it's history and it's physics and it's Frampton and it's Nelson and it's doctors and PhDs. And it's got a plot that'll kick your butt. Fantastic. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I mean, that's a hell of a mixture there, to be honest. It is, brother. It is. It's like a, it's like a, uh, a buffet, you know, uh, choose what you like, <laughs> enjoy what you like. Some of the things, you know, I, my writing isn't for everyone. It's my eighth book. I've written fiction. I've written nonfiction. Uh, I, I started out late in life because of the death of my firstborn son. He, he passed away and it was, uh, it was a tragedy. And because I had been very involved in politics and so forth, uh, Simon and Schuster asked me to write the book and it's called Beautiful Nate. Uh, based on um, John Lennon's song, Beautiful Boy, and just a tender, tender book. So that started it, and all these few years later, I'm eight books into it, and we got to move it, move it. I'm enjoying it, baby. <laughs> well, I will have to say, you you, you are one of the very uh, cool authors who, uh, who who's, who's not all stuffy and uh, all about yourself and all about your books and all that. You're having a good time, brother. I tell you, it's like, here's the deal, guys. The three of us are talking. There's many, many people listening to us and viewing us. Yep. But the truth is, we are enjoying fellowship, man. We are. It's the fellowship of the ring. It's the fellowship of, of the army. It's the fellowship of being together with people who are like-minded and enjoy life. I mean, if you don't enjoy life, what are you doing living? <laughs> oh, I totally agree there. 
Like find positive instead of a negative. Absolutely. And any man that has Kansas City Chiefs attire on uh, in my presence, I bow before you, baby. <laughs> well, it's the Royals stuff. I do have my Chiefs stuff. I wore that the other day. So. Oh, I see now. I see that it's Royals. Okay. Now there we go. It's all right. Well, my, my, my son, my son, Nate, that I spoke of, uh, lived and passed away in Kansas City. And he w- we had some of the best times uh, going to the Royals games, just hanging out and, you know, going to Arthur Bryant's. You can't have barbecue unless you have Arthur Bryant's. Uh, there's there's about there's about three or four really really good places there. You consider Gates I mean, it's all barbecue good. in there? Gates barbecue is that pretty good? Oh yeah, it's excellent. I love the sauce there. It's it's like above something. Arthur Bryant's is an institution, so everybody's got to go there. <laughs> but Gates is really good too. They got um oh what's it called um uh, uh Oklahoma Joe's or something up there. It kind of oh, sounds funny yeah. that. Yeah, yeah the Mama Joe's, but they started with the burnt ends and stuff, and you never had burnt ends. Oh my God! I don't they think. Are fantastic. I, yeah, I think the truth is, you never have burnt ends. Burnt ends have you. They take <laughs> oh, and they kidnap you, <laughs> take you to another dimension. <laughs> I love them. Oh my God! Oh, yeah. but, but but I understand we have a Hutchison, Kansas connection too. Is that accurate? Yes. Yes, we uh, there. I, I I am in uh, Hutchinson, Kansas, of all places. Uh, well, let me just let me just tell you, my father-in-law was born there. We've 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 he was we've soared soared through Hutchinson, Kansas, at thirty miles an hour, and we saw. That's really the only that's the only way to do it is to soar through here as quick as humanly possible. Because if not, you 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 will you will become a bad driver. Uh, you 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 will be rude to people. Uh, this is the only this is the only town where people have to put up on Facebook every year during the state fair. Be nice to people because there's people from out of town coming in. Uh, we have got. He's not lying. <laughs> we have got a. Gentlemen, let me tell you, I had to be nice to my father-in-law so that he would allow me to marry his daughter. She wasn't born in Hutchinson, but he had a Hutchinson <laughs> spirit, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, so I, it's it's really it's a joy to be with you guys. I know that uh, you, you're busy on your show and you're interviewing different people, but to be able to take just a few minutes to talk about to trust in what we cannot see. I, I got to tell you, man, it's uh, it's an honor. Well, this this book uh, is is incredible. Talk to me a little bit about uh, some of the different reviews and different things you've gotten on the book so far. It's been it's been remarkable. Uh, I I put my manuscript out to a number of my classmates, guys who know me, who kick my butt. They would just absolutely kick my butt. And and the greatest thing that came back to me were a series of reviews from generals and. Uh, congressmen and all these others who are just, they knew me when I was 18 to 22, you know, kind of thing. And um, they're like, Dan, this, there's something magical about this. This is remarkable. Kirkus did a great uh, review. Uh, we just had a number of other reviews. It's, it's just being launched. So a number of people are reviewing. There's always the occasional bad review. And I love those because, it's, because, you know, Especially when it go, you go online and they try to say something, but they misspell it in their own review. I just laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, man. You know. Uh, That's great. So, it is so awesome. So, so, uh, so this th- this book. Um, w- what are you planning on doing next, or do you have anything planned? I I do. In fact, I'm. Uh, I, I've got uh, I, I have the honor of actually living right on the Boise River. Uh, it's it's a joyous place, a, a real con, uh, place to contemplate and and take time. And so I'm already I've done the, uh, the last year of research onto the second book of To Trust in What We Cannot See, and my goal is to make it a trilogy. It really does uh, demand such research. It's the only fiction book. That, that publishers have told me, my heavens, you have a works consultant page at the end of it? You know? Yeah. That's about awesome. Seven or, seven or eight pages long. Because I want the people who've given me comment about it to do it. So where the where the book takes us 
is through the whole issue of 1913, through the idea of killing those five tyrants, Hitler and, and Stalin and Lenin and Trotsky and Tito, and what the world would be like if you did do that. And so now, having established that credibility of time travel and how it occurs and what the history of the physics are, the book, book two comes in. Book two will be, how do you go back and save the lives of people who died? So um, uh, it'll be Lincoln, and it'll be Custer, believe it or not. It'll be JFK, RFK, Martin Luther King, and some of the people that will be involved in it, uh, in helping along with it, will be uh, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, we've got a number of side uh, characters that will come in and, and intersperse themselves in it. And what the world would look like if those men had uh, lived. So in, in uh, the second volume, we'll talk about uh, Martin Luther King. M many, many people don't realize that his name was not really Martin Luther King. And we talk about that. His name was Michael King. And uh, that's what he was born, and that's what he carried his entire life until he became famous. And then then he uh, legally changed it a couple of years before he died. Well, he's, but, he, 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 had to have a, he had to have a gimmick change. He, he couldn't be Mike anymore. He had to be Martin. Uh, you, well, I like, I like Mike was already taken up, I think, somewhere. I don't know. Uh, you mentioned uh, Hutchinson, Kansas. Uh, some of John's favorite memories are coming over here and uh, getting the crowd to hate him because he is a professional wrestler. And uh, so he comes over here, and he gets he gets the crowd just to hate him. Oh, tell me about it, John. I want to hear. <laughs> oh yeah, it was I was pretty good. It's like I I mean I did it simple. I didn't get vulgar with stuff, but like I'd sit there and go out, and I came up with this tagline like blah blah blah, you know, because people were always booing and yelling stuff at me, and I'd be like, blah, 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 I'm sorry that the concession stand doesn't take vision cards, which is basically the king's <laughs> first vision stands. Or I'd pick on, like, I was told by an old-timer, I go, you find one person in the crowd, and you pick on them constantly, you make them a sympathetic figure, and everybody else hates you for it. Yeah, it's like there was one little kid at the show, he had, um, he had dark hair and stuff, but I knew it wasn't his parents, but the guy he was with... It was his friend's dad and stuff, and I go, "Hey, you ever wonder why both your parents have red hair and you don't?" You know, he's like, uh, 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 like that. I was like, "I was like, are you just missing teeth because you're young, or did you hit your meth dealer way too much, or something?" And it's like, oh, there were people who wanted to kill me for that stuff. Oh my heavens, John! So I've got to ask, <laughs> what kind of attire did you wear when you wrestled? Oh, I well, when I wrestled, I kind of did like uh, me and a friend. We started out as a tag team, and if you've ever watched wrestling, you, ever, you remember the Big Boss Man from the old WWF? Oh yeah. Okay, we had we had to get up like his, but I had white shirts instead, and we called ourselves. At first, we were Law and Order. Then me and a friend we got together and did it, and I mean, he was about three inches shorter, but we looked a lot alike, uh -huh. and uh, we started calling ourselves Home. And security, because that's when the big thing was going. And then oh, yeah. Yeah. I was just like, I was a huge bad guy. My the two guys I always wrestled with were a heck of a better in the ring, but I was great at getting people to yell and scream and hate us. <laughs> well, you, uh, if you have a historical background on it, there was a, a guy out of uh, Michigan years ago. His name was Killer Carl Cox. <laughs> oh yeah, that's how I got. It friend of mine over i we called we called him killer carl krueger i oh, based okay. it on cox i mean yeah. i've heard yeah. stories about uh cox i forget what's his name dennis something or the other yeah. but he was um, they said he had one of the most powerful punches they ever did it was kind of like bruce lee's one inch you know yep. punch um there's a wrestler that I got to be really good friends with. He toured, and he was like what they call an enhancement talent. He made everybody else look good. Oh, yeah. But there was a show where Cox was at, and Cox was just there to watch it. And this guy came up and kept bugging Cox, and Cox was like, hey, I'm trying to watch this. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. But anyway, um, Dusty Wolf was telling me, he goes, yeah, because the guy just wouldn't shut up. And then he finally, like, pushed Cox. And from about, oh, this far away, oh. Cox – Knocked him, knocked him the heck out. I mean, knocked him out cold. Oh my gosh! Yeah, he was a good dude. 
wasn't the one you wanted to screw with. <laughs> well, uh, we we have this uh, this situation. I, I'm old enough to be a grandfather, and so when I say I started late writing books, I'm telling you, I started late writing books. But I but I raised my kids and then and now my grandkids with Killer Carl Cox in the ring, baby. Me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I take those little kids down, and it's pile driving central, and uh, I, you know, I earn my, I earn their respect. They earn their bruises. That's all I can tell you. Oh yeah, <laughs> Herb Gerwig. That was his name, Herb. Yeah. Well, well Dennis, Damn. it it's been an honor and a privilege. Uh, we definitely have to do this again, my friend. Now that we've now that we've got the right Dennis Mansfield on Skype, <laughs> those other two guys are gonna get Skype calls from me, and be like, "Who the hell is this Jiggy Jaguar guy?" But uh, <laughs> well, here's the, here's the book. Make sure you guys grab the book because it would be awesome for us to get in the ring together and wrestle through this book together to trust oh, what we cannot see. That was a history awesome. up in um, college. That's what I was going to do, was be a history teacher. But uh, well, he's John, you know, thing with Hitler and everything. I was like, oh, wow, okay. You World War II was my favorite area. You will love it. If you go to DennisMansfield.com, which I think you've gone to, uh, you, can, you, can, you can order it. It is a heck of a book. Not because I wrote it. I think it wrote not, itself. Not because I wrote it. <laughs> no, I seriously, I, it called out to be written. And and when, once I did, I was like, this author's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like it's just, I mean, just a tangent you can go off in with all that. Uh, well, so Dennis, that, gentlemen, I, 